My name is Drew, and um, I'm going to be presenting today on sticks and text. Um, in particular, we're talking about sticks, taxi 2.0. These are standards from the Oasis spec, and what they're what they're used for is cyber threat intelligence, right? How do we, in a, uh, a vendor neutral way, share information about cyber threats that are out there? So, um, a little bit about my background. Uh, I work for I start my own company called Nine Effects. And we do, our primary customer is the federal government, uh, particularly the U.S. Department of Defense. And um, we do a lot either in the software engineering space or in cyberspace. Um, as well, my personal background, um, I'm, a, I'm a cyber officer in the Army Reserves. Um, nothing in this presentation reflects the views from my employer, Department of Defense, U.S. government, <laughs> or any of my relatives. So, there. The, um, uh, my background is actually in functional programming. Um, so if you have been, if you're a software engineer, you've got experience languages like Lisp, Erlang, Haskell, Scala, Clojure. Uh, that's what I've been doing for the last five or six years. And very often, functional programming lends itself to distributed systems. So we've, so we've had some commercial contracts in the IoT space. <clears throat> so recently, um, I was selected as, I'm an editor on the Taxi 2.1 specification. So the next version of Taxi that comes out um, I don't your fault. I mean, it'll, be, it'll, be, it'll be my fault. So, yeah, in this case, um, you know, we're working on the next revision for that piece. It was actually as Taxi Two implies in the Taxi One, so we'll talk about some of that background as well. Um, so, I don't really care about cyber threat intelligence, right? I'm a distributed systems engineer, and so my interest in cyber threat intelligence is the actual systems behind it. I'm interested in tooling, right? And in this case. Cyber threat intelligence can be a huge, huge platform. Right? You can imagine when you have automated sensors um, collecting information, whether it be net flow, whether it be malware signatures, that you can get billions and billions of measurements pretty quickly. And so that's what my actual background is. I'm not a defender. I have been worked as a defender for like 10 years, and I'm not an analyst. So my background is in distributed systems, and really just a, someone said, hey, here's a chance to make a buck trying to solve this problem. So. <clears throat> Let's talk about the specs, what are they? STICS stands for uh, Structured Threat Information Exchange. And this is the basic way in which we serialize um, the cyber threat intelligence itself, right? This is just a, a, a platform neutral transport in terms of how to move indicators across uh, platforms. Right. Is it an expression or is it an exchange? Have expression listed in there. Oh, yeah. It's actually, it's. Um, Expression. Yeah, sorry about that. That's okay. Whereas the um, taxi is the exchange, right? So tax itself stands for Trusted Automated Exchange of Intelligence Information. So whereas sticks is a form of way to serialize data, taxi is, is the method by which we pass around or actually share it, right? So for example, I can have sticks data that's either was that taxi. 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't know the sticks piece. So, you know, just at some point it's a convenient piece. But right, taxi is, is a way to move it. Um, they're both um, vendor neutral, right? That's one of the huge drivers beyond this piece. There's a number of ways to record information about um, uh, indicators, right? It could be as simple as logs for your favorite application. Many vendors have their own proprietary systems, right? To either generate indicators. Um, all of us who have worked in the defensive space before have dealt with seams, right? Which are designed to integrate uh, data from heterogeneous sources. Right, and so the, on the vendor side, there's already solutions there. And so what's missing here is the standards-based approach. And we'll talk about two types, right? You know, there's the, the Jura standards, which are the, the standards that are created by consensus through a standards body through an organization versus some of the de facto standards, right? Where if I say, hey, here's a snort rule, you know what I mean, even though you, your system may not revolve around that, snorts not necessarily come from the standards body. Um, so the problem, this originally got its uh, roots from Department of Homeland Security. Uh, DHS has a huge requirement in terms of protecting critical national infrastructure within the United States as part of their mandate. And so what they realized is, is in order to increase our cybersecurity posture, we need to know what's going on out there. We need a way to communicate that. Um, for example, a lot of us remember, some of us probably still use like the SANS Internet Storm Center, right, to see you know, what the shape of the events are, but from, from the federal perspective, uh, we need the ability to have trusted ways to exchange information um, in between Indies who are inside of our groups. Uh, 
have any of y'all worked with the InfraGuard uh, group, for example, which provides a uh, community, community of interest around sharing information for cybersecurity on the federal space? So that's part of why DHS was involved in this. And then MITRE, if you're not familiar with MITRE, they're an FFRDC, or a Federally Funded Research Development Center. And say they do a lot of the um, either software engineering technical analysis or support for federal initiatives like this. And there's a number of them, you know, Lincoln Labs, uh, Arrow, there's a, there's a whole set of groups which provide this sort of support to federal government. So, starting in the DHS and MITRE space, in order to gain um, broader adoption, DHS and MITRE pushed the specification out to OASIS. And OASIS is a nonprofit standards group. And their goal is to, and they, make, they handle a number of standards, right? Whether it be something describing doc book or documentation software projects, whether it be something like legal XML formats, their job is to create and maintain standards. And that's what they do. Some of the organizations like the IETF, Energy Task Force, um, OASIS is in the business of gaining consensus around standards. And finally, one thing that's in common and the differentiator for sticks and tactics is both systems are based primarily on JSON based serialization. JSON is a text based format, so there's obviously trade offs here between binary formats in terms of efficiency and size of the payload. But JSON has become a popular form of uh, data interchange between systems with, with less of the complexities than uh, sometimes associated with stuff like XML. So let's talk about what's already out there. Um, so by the fact that we're talking about sticks and taxi two, right, you can bet that there's a sticks and taxi one, right? I mean, it's, that's a giveaway. And so the predecessor, um, also HTTP uh, access for sharing, right? In other words, you know, web services based change, but it's an XML based format. So that was one of the differentiators between it. But sticks and taxi, have, taxi one have gained pretty wide adoption. Um, uh, at the end of last year, in December, the European Union, uh, the standards organizations there said that sticks and taxi can be used, uh, particularly sticks, uh, I forget what the particular versions were, sticks 1.2 and taxi 1.1 can be used in EU procurements as this is a indicator that the systems we're procuring are um, standard space for sharing cyber credit until date. So it's gotten some official recognition at that level in addition to already being used, for example, for some DHS uh, threat feeds available to the public through registration. So um, there's there. You notice that in addition to sticks and taxi, in the middle we talk about Cybox. And Cybox uh, stands for Cyber Observable Expressions. Cybox in uh, sticks and taxi 2 actually got rolled into sticks 2. So we'll talk about that. But Cybox is a way of uh, describing actual observables or observations of data that occur um, in the threat space. And so those actually got rolled into sticks too. So if you wonder why don't we have Cybox 2.x, that's because it's, it's been rolled into the rest of the organization. One of my favorite uh, standards out there, also, a lot of these ones will come from MITRE, is ATT&CK. And ATT&CK itself is referred to, it's the um, Adversarial Tactics. It stands for, sorry, Adversarial Tactics, Techniques, and Common Knowledge. And what this is, is ATT&CK is a database of how threat actors operate. And so a lot of times we'll describe this as like, for example, like a problem set. You know, so for example, if there is a state actor who has certain tactics, techniques, and procedures, right, the way these adversaries uh, operate, whether it be how they gain entrance, how they maintain footholds, or and how they um, pivot and how they move laterally throughout your organization, these are encapsulated in the um, in, in the grammar of the attack specification. And is that mostly old for uh, nation state attackers? Well, a lot of it can be business, right? A lot of it can be ransomware and criminal. I'd imagine in terms of the number of independent actors that you'll probably find more in the criminal space. Um, though there's obviously criminal activity associated with certain nation state actors, right? In terms of, for example, getting hard cash for the North Korean regime and what have you. But um, it in general describes adversarial behavior, but yeah, it could apply there. It even apply to the hacktivists set as well. Um, so even though this is an existing standard, um, also coming out of MITRE, as you'd expect, because um, MITRE was originally behind um, Sticks and Taxi, that there's um, some uh, some overlap here. The attack uh, grammars have actually been ported into Sticks 2. So if you are interested in this sort of um, information about adversarial techniques, or whatever else, you can pull it into uh, a Sticks or Taxi 2 compliant system. 
and, and move the sit there. It's a good idea to see, because sticks and, sticks and taxi two don't have traction yet, what real world indicators look like in these systems. Okay. You, you said grammar. What do you mean grammar? You're looking dumb. Oh, sorry. Uh, grammar for that. So a grammar is a way of defining languages, right? So this is in the case of um, grammar. It says, here's how we put together different phrases. So basically, sticks and taxi can read the same commands you've had set up for. Well, so it's, it's attack. In this case, attack was actually translated into sticks two. So it is a. It is not just in sticks two grammar. It is a sticks two representation of language, just like I translated the Iliad into French, for example. I didn't actually do that, but you know. So it. Could, so these these indicators can be consumed by sticks two systems. Attack does not did not originally was not originally produced in six two. Okay, that also comes out of minor minor is their common attack pattern, enumeration, classification, and this is just not tied particularly to actors in this case, but it is these are tactics and techniques or, or these are procedures to exploit these as well. And um, they actually um, KPEC is important because KPEC is integrated as a first class citizen. In sticks two, and we'll go look at a KPEC example down the road. But in terms of external references, right? If I'm de describing, for example, uh, something in the KPEC database, I can actually reference the KPEC number um, inside my sticks object. So you can say, okay, that translates back. And I think one which we all probably know are CVEs, um, common vulnerability enumerations. Is that right? Common vulnerabilities and you ask. Yeah, CVE. So anyway, so CVE is part of the, part of the NVD, the National Vulnerability Database. And so these are, many times there, there's an exploitable piece of software, right? For example, you know, piece of software, X is vulnerable to SQL injection, right? And you know, typically it's associated with what the vector is, what the risk is, and what the impact is, right? So very hard, very easy to exploit, and very high impact. Common vulnerabilities and exposures. Exposures. And so this, the CVE database is something that um, very often when a vendor is referring uh, to, if a, if a vendor ends up going to products compromise, very often you will see it come out in a CVE that, that um, influences um, things like STIGs and other issues in terms of how we remediate our systems to respond to these threats. Beyond that, outside of CVEs, there's actually another class of errors which are based around poor configurations. I don't know what that one is, but it's, uh, it's maintained in a similar database. Cyber kill chain, for those of you in the military cyberspace, cyber kill chain comes out of Lockheed Martin. Um, and again, cyber kill chain itself is referenced, but these are, okay, here's the attack, the steps you go, people go through to attack, to exploit, and um, there's actual references to the kill chains as well inside of sticks, particularly re relevant if you're exchanging cyber threat intelligence in the military space. And then finally, we've got what what are the de facto standards, right? If I were to ask you, how would you describe the vulnerability? You know, you may say, okay, well, here's a SHA-256 hash of this piece of malware, right? Which is moderately useful, assuming that it hasn't gone through a packer or whatever else. But, you know, typically we write indicators to look for stuff like Yara scripts, uh, bro scripts, or, um, you know, snort rules, in terms of how we can actually pick this up. And so those are some of the standards out there that are kind of, uh, Almost compete with um, uh, with sticks two in some ways, <clears throat> and of course, anybody reads this case, I don't know how much of an eye, how much of an eye exam this is, but hey, there's 14 competing standards. We're gonna write one to, to rule them all. Yeah, now we have 15 standards. <laughs> you, you mentioned your really quick. Did you trigger something? Um, read this out. Um, did you know you can go and upload those to? Um, Virus total. Like they straight up integrate with Yara scripts and can go and tell you if they've got anything that matches that. And like they, they, they can tell you, so you can set it up to have it alert you if it sees it, and it will also go back and look at everything they've ever seen to see if it matches it. That's pretty cool. Yeah. That's pretty cool. We'll, we'll look later on at something called Sticks Patterning Language, and it has a lot of those same capabilities in its development as well. And so, in terms of you know, the goal here is for this to be sort of a, you know, uh, collaboratively standards-based development of a language to be able to find these, these sort of pieces as well. And it's got temporal stuff, and we'll go look at those. So, first of all, we're going to get into Sticks 2.x because, uh, and I say 2.x because really, Sticks 2 is a family, right? So, the Sticks 1, right, through major and minor iterations, right, they may be breaking changes, for example, through some of the major iterations in it, but 
Sticks two, sticks one was all XML based, you know, follow the same development pattern wherever else. As sticks two is essentially different and um, is, is an essentially different class than sticks one in terms of tool sets, right? Say, hey, I've got this information in sticks. If it's in sticks 1.0 or 1.1, maybe not such a big deal. Nothing to do with sticks 2.x effectively in terms of your ability to exchange information. So there are basically a few essential components to sticks. Right? The first are data objects, right? And sticks data, sorry, sticks domain objects. And domain objects represent um, essential items to describe sort of the, the CTI set, right? I mean, you could have, for example, things that matter, and they just don't have to be indicators. They can be a report, right? An analyst can generate a report, right? And so this is the type of information that we're going to capture in a state state object. Or we're going to describe an intrusion set, right? So these are, you know, here's the group of folks around these tasks, right? And there's, and there's connections between these different types of domain objects, but essentially, the building blocks for sticks to um, cyber threat intelligence escapes comes from what we call the, the, the SDOs, or, or domain objects. Beyond that, there's the interconnection between them, right? And these are the sticks relationships objects. And these are, um, they're directional, right? So in this case, tool exploits vulnerability, right? So in this case, my tool could be in that scripting engine, you know, my sticks relationship object is an exploitation one or exploit, and then vulnerability could be um, uh, a slow loris, right? Well, that is uh, re overwhelming resources on HTTP server, for example. So <clears throat> SROs allow us to take what we see, right, and then form directed graphs, be able to, to establish relationships between them. <clears throat> Beyond problems and stuff like that, observables are, are the next building block in the space. And observables are things that we see as analysts that would you typically think of as triggering an indicator, right? For example, um, if I receive an email message that contains phishing content, right? That email message or that even part of that my multi-part message would be part of what I would see as an observable. If I have a piece of malware associated with a ransomware attack on my machine, right? I can think of that as those are real ones and zeros to the extent that those things are real. Right? I, I, they may have a hash to them. They may be of a particular file type. Right? It may be a PE executable or it might be an ELF file in Linux box. So observables are the way the sticks language describes um, these real world components to either use digital forensics um, and, uh, and and how they how they relate to the threat scale. <clears throat> Finally, we have sticks pattern language, and as you know, we've already alluded to. Six pattern language is designed to be processed by machines, right, in terms of to describe how I would detect something usually in the wild, right? I'm going to pass. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. There. <clears throat> and so the pattern language serves, if, if you're familiar with sort rules, if you're familiar with the yard stuff like that, it's somewhere. It has an object hierarchy and it's got the ability to say, all right, I want to be able to exploit either the properties of these objects or temporal relationships or even things like repetition to be able to observe events in the real world. <clears throat> so to establish a base, here's what you can, just so you can understand, okay, sticks objects with things in the real world, what they look like. We have things in common, right? Because <clears throat> part of having a, a shared or standards-based language to exchange these deals means we have to know what things mean. Um, in the case of sticks, you'll notice that you've got um, everything has a type, right? You've got, for example, as you mentioned earlier, I can have a report, I can have an indicator, right? And so the, the types are combined along with um, something called UUIDs, which are universal identifiers. Does anybody end up using UUIDs in their standard coding practice to, to identify? Typically, when I generate a UUID, that should be globally unique. Right, because of the algorithm behind generating the ID um, and the number of bytes it represents, that means that scope-wise, for modern time, a UID, if I generate it, should be unique to our organization. Right, so the what's important about this, because the identifier includes the type plus a UID, this means that if I have, for example, report one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, that nobody else will have a report number out there with that with that indicator. Right, and so that being the case. 
that means that this thing is globally scoped. Whereas I say, hey, I saw a file come through. Um, a lot of times, a lot of the systems used to collect information in CTI are sort of um, at this point in time. Whereas this represents a unique object throughout the scope of, of, the, of the space. We'll talk about that later. Um, these first two types are required. We have the ability to, to have an identifier to an identity. An identity here is actually a person. So we can point to a person and say, okay, this is the analyst that generated this report. Or here is the operator who found this, um, who found this malware on the system. And so we have the ability to, to, to do attribution, right? In this case, it's not attribution of the actual malware, but it's attribution of the actual data object we're looking at. Very often indicators. And then obviously, um, creation and modified times. You'll notice that both are required. This is because um, six objects actually can be versioned. Right? As an analyst, I can go in and say, here's what I saw and say, oh, okay, maybe not, right? So go, go through revision two. So in this case, the created timestamp remains the same, but when we go into our modified timestamp, um, we can push it forward. So if you had the same created timestamp and a different modified timestamp, that's how we do versioning within the state space. That means, okay, we have made some sort of improvement, refinement, or correction to our observation and to our data object, and this is how we move forward in the system. Is there any uh, inherent historical look at this or do you there can be and we'll talk about that when we get to taxi collection servers but taxi collection servers have the ability to optionally store version items on them right so i can choose to maintain that and there's a lot of reasons why i want to and we'll talk about tombstone and how that works or, or how that should work but when you're collecting something at such a large scale um there's actually right now in sticks there's no such thing as deleting the observation but you can revoke it Right, but um, that sounds cool. It's actually kind of terrible to implement <laughs> in terms of the pain of implementing it from an infrastructure perspective. Because if I receive, let's say we're dealing in an area when I have, I can receive version one, two, three, and they're obviously not numbered like that. Versions are, are uniquely identified by concatenating the creation date and the um, modified date for a particular ID. So if I say, okay, I received version one, and then I receive version four, and version you know, the fourth version I received says revoked, right? You say, okay, cool, I'll just delete it from my database. But the problem is, what if you receive two and a half after you delete it from your database? You have to know it's there. So if you don't maintain tombstone, so if you don't maintain a record that this item has at least been revoked, then if you receive information out of order, then you can act on an item as if it um, is still active, even though it's been revoked. And you knew it was revoked, but you, just not made, you didn't maintain track of it. And that's one of the interesting issues in terms of how do you deal with a world where there can be, you know, typically versions aren't used that often, right? Uh, we can actually branch off and create, we can reference the original version of it, we're gonna modify it. And only the original creator has the authority to modify it. Um, but it's, uh, it, it can lead to some complexity and implementations. But so these are just some of the examples things you hear. One of the things I like um, are markings and granular markings. Uh, you could think of this one of the common markings for these things is what we call, call TLP, right? Traffic light protocol for uh, uh, green, yellow, red, right? I can share this outside of my organization, share it with common, share it with caution, or can't share it at all, right? In the military, we also have um, expressions for marketing references. They're called secret, top secret, SEI, you know, blah, 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 confidential, super, 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 yeah, super, super, super secret squirrel. Um, but one of the fun things is with granular markings. Because we can say that for an observation, right, I can say that part of this is shareable, but I can't tell you who it's connected to, right? So I can actually take from one object, I can have different components of that object classified at different levels. And that's the granular markings deal. And it's actually done through, <clears throat> through an actual language to identify the markings called selectors. And it says, okay, this component is not at the same level as the rest of it. Another Important thing is when you're analyzing data, right? And I've talked about grammar. You always have to agree on a vocabulary as well, right? And this is um, sticks to answer this. Is something called open vocabularies. And what these are is these are um, uh, a set of phrases that we're agreed that we should use if, if it matches, right, to describe the same events, right? So we have one, for example, to talk about hash algorithms, right? The open vocabulary for hash algorithms. We might agree that. MD5 is one, right? But if you have it as a lowercase MD5, and I have as MD space five, right? When we're doing our analysis on them, we might not recognize the same event, right? So by developing a common vocabulary, 
this is a point where we can say, all right, um, we agree that whenever we describe this hash and algorithm, we'll use the same phrase. And <clears throat> as it implies open vocabulary, you can actually go beyond that. But the idea is we need to come to some sort of um, uh, centered deal, right? We should say, if we're going to describe this one, this is what we call it. The uh, malware label? Is that like name of malware? Uh, I don't think so. I think it's going to be stuff like Trojan. I think it's going to be stuff like, and I don't have it in front of me. Because I was just, I was curious because you know, every AV product names it Definitely. whatever they want. And it's, it's that part of it is to push to a standard naming convention for things like that. I know like for threat sophistication and stuff like that, they're going to have typical activist, state actor, you know, that type of piece. I don't remember which ones they use, um, that I used it for that case. Um, and I copied and pasted the wrong thing there. That should actually that should have actually been the MD5 Whirlpool SHA-256 for the different action algorithms. So we've talked about, okay, yeah, there's different. Here is what the, the predefined objects are as of 62.0. Obviously, as this number bumps up, right, as it becomes 62.1, 62.2, et cetera, you can add more and more um, items to the vocabulary. Because right now, we realize that some of these are actually even stubbed out, and we don't have the ability to completely describe the problem set. Right, or to address, um, you know, to a, a, a true discussion there. But we also provide extensibility points where um, you can go beyond the built-ins, right, even now, without having to go to the next version, without having to depend on Oasis and the standards body to be able to address the problems within your set. <clears throat> this is what it looks like um, in terms of the raw implementation. This is JSON, which basically is JavaScript object notation. Um, I'm sure some. At this point, a bunch of us have start have seen this, if not necessarily on the software engineering side, but at least in terms of a lot of data stored this way, a lot of data that's sent across. Originally, it was designed for shipping information from servers and um, storing information actually in your browser, in your JavaScript interpreter in your browser for active content there. But in this case, this is the combination. Remember how I talked about how an ID is a combination of a type and uh, a UUID, right? And so this should be the only attack pattern of this sort, right? You know, on a global scale here. Um, as sticks moves forward, there will probably what will probably come about is the capability of actual object signing, right? Which is the ability to go ahead and say, okay, here's my signature where I can cryptographically verify that yes, indeed. Um, uh, in this case, I don't have a created ref, but if I had a created ref here, I can say, oh yeah, Bob indeed created this um, indicator. Can you merge those? So let's say that uh, two organizations create. Um, you can reference them. You cannot merge them. So if you have the same threat actor hacking at two different organizations and two people in the organization, you know, independently create basically the same sure. signature. Those yep. never get combined at any level? Never, because um, the permissions to create and modify come from the creator, right? Not, the, you know, not like, not, not, not like hallelujah, but more <laughs> from the creators, like this is the analyst who, who generated this from the machine who did. But, what, but in this case, what we do is we can fork off, we can essentially do a fork Right, we can do this, and we can reference it back. It was originally created by so and so, but but the um, created ref, which isn't on this one, but you know who actually created whatever else, that is important for the veracity of the data, right? And in the and in and in this space, it, this is not designed just for the sort of the public space. Hey, everybody, here's what I found, but here's who I am, right? And here's how you know that you're not because it's bad to get fake CTI, right? That can be you know. Uh, that can cause you know significant emotional events to occur. Um, one of the other things too is that in this case we have an external reference that I mentioned, you know stuff like attack, like CVE, like uh, Lockheed Martin cyber kill chain. Um, in this case, we're we're actually connecting back to a KPEC, which is one of the minor standards. So instead of having to define, you know, a huge object here, we can say, oh, my reference can look at a KPEC or or this CVE. One of the things I talked about is all right, so we've got this. Um, uh, vocabulary of objects that are present right now, right? Whether it be an attack type, whether it be a report, um, or whether it be an adversary, or whether it be an identity. Well, perhaps I have to, perhaps these objects are enough to describe the things that uh, my organization sees, right? Or, in this case too, it allows us, as a standards body, that we can go ahead and play with and experiment with, okay, would this be good for the next release? So we can use custom objects to do that. And so custom objects, <clears throat> Um, they have to meet the requirements. Um, one of the first slides I showed was the required properties for a sticks object, right? Custom objects are still SDOs, right? They still have to adhere to that set. They optionally have it created by, right? But they have to have a type, right? They have to have an, 
you know, they have to have an ID, which is a combination of that um, type plus a UID. All right, so they have to meet those deals. But if they do that, then I have the ability to create some of my own objects as well to describe things in my um, within my space. Additionally, it might be that some of the um, addition, some of the um, objects that are already present in the 2.0 vocabulary, or even the next one, 2.1, get most of what I would like to do, but maybe not all. In this case, for example, <clears throat> you know, the granular markings right now. This is actually not a custom property, but I could say, in addition to a granular marking of being green, yellow, red, I could say confidential secret top secret, right, or unclassified for officially sold, right, or um, personally identifiable information. So the ability to customize these deals allows us to go to sort of the next level. And then finally is that we can modify vocabularies, the OVs, the open vocabularies, to make sure they're speaking our language, for example, if we're using a hashing algorithm that's not present in that OV. Right? We can add it to our OV and say, here's what we, we agree to call it within our organization. So even though we might not have what we want um, in, in the current spec or the next spec, customization allows us to uh, address the issues that we see within our enterprise and then possibly go back into the standards body to come out with one of the next spec releases as well. So we talked about the building blocks, right? So with the mortar form remains the SROs or stick relationships objects. And so they're one of two things, right? They're either relationships, which are pretty standard. These are the directional graphs, right, between node A and node B, right? These are the edges, right? And they describe a directional relationship there. <clears throat> Beyond that, we've got something called sightings. And sightings is they're a little bit richer um, than uh, the relationships there because they have another um, another a number of special properties that aren't in place in a um, uh, in a typical relationship object. Well, SROs are pretty simple, so it's best to, to be able to describe them. All right, so here's the case of. All right, so so what does this directed graph look like, right? So in this case, we can see an attack pattern, right? It targets a vulnerability. Right. In this case, if we're talking about, um, I'm guessing since the Iranian group was caught partially by uh, fish labs out of Charleston, let's go ahead and assume that they're using spear fish in the event. They were. All right. So I got you. So in this case, the vulnerability they're talking, they're targeting is, you know, between the, the head and the keyboard, right? You know, between brain and keyboard. So it could be that they are going after the vulnerability is is, is, is spear fish, right? Is, uh, you know, a group of folks are vulnerable to it. Um, or they could be going after an identity, right? The identity could be um, a university, right? It could be Virginia Tech, is, right? It could be that. So this is the sort of the, the relational piece through it. And, and you notice there's not necessarily, identity doesn't move back to attack part. It does not go backwards through targets to attack pattern. You could say is targeted by, but really there's a, there's a directional relationship on SROs. And that's why they end up generating directed graphs. And then obviously the tool set ones. So this just gives you an example of the level of details um, <clears throat> that you're going to see in a sighting versus um, uh, information like a, a relationship object. There's a lot more timing data that goes on. Um, in this case, you have you have stuff like repetitions as well. So sightings are a unique form of relationships compared to SROs, but they are a detailed um, indicator of relationship between uh, usually affecting usually indicators. And it's one of the more um, complex but robust ways to expl express the relationship between SDOs. Cyber observables, right? They have their own forms of relationships. <coughs> Sticks is a relatively complicated standard. I found out as I got into it, um, thinking it was going to be uh, an easy thing to pick up. Uh, cyber observable relationships are not the same as SROs, even though they're both relationship objects. Don't look behind the purple curtain. Right? <laughs> You know, um, but uh, one of the cool things about them is they provide the ability to do extensions, right? So this is, I can add a granular level of detail to what I'm looking at through extension. And, and we'll talk about that as, as an example. We'll talk about, for example, say, hey, I found a file on my system, right? Well, this file is going to have basic properties. Let's say it has a file name, a directory, and a size, right? But there's a lot more information I want to know, for example, if it's uh, an executable, right? You know, if it's a a PE binary, right, or if it's an ELF on a Linux field, then we're going to be interested in inodes, we're going to be interested in what the header is. You know, if it's an image file, we're going to be interested in what the format of it is. So the extensions provide us ways to enrich, you know, the basic things we see. You know, some things don't get much of an enrichment, right? An IPv4 address or an IPv6 address is an IPv4 address, right? There's not a whole lot of ways to make it more 
interesting, right? At best, we might say sometimes it's associated with the DNS link. But there's a lot of observables here that we can add data to, and we do that through extensions. Finally, um, just like we have um, the open vocabularies we use with SDOs, we've got the ability to drop in vocabularies and enumerations there. Type of observables at, at the base level themselves are relatively simple, right? I mean, they're simple a combination of type, and everything has to have a type, and then finally, you know, a group of extensions add on to it, right? But that's because there's not much common between, um, unlike when we look at something like a, when we look at a stick state object, right? We go think about what it has in common. It has to have an ID, right? We don't know that we necessarily uniquely identified an observable, right? It's just a file. We don't know that's the only instance of that file. We don't know who created it, so we don't have created by rest. So the, the basics for it are very simple. But extensions give us the ability to go deep and describe to get into depth to it. Artifacts are almost any combination of one and zero, whereas something like a file or an IPv4 address is a little bit more um, is, is, a, is a less generalized way of describing particular things we're going to see in the cyber threat space. This is just an example, actually, of artifact. What's put in place there, right? So we can look at stuff like mime types, whatever else to describe. You know, the, the basis is it an image slash JPEG? Is it you know, is it an application slash PDF, text slash XML? <clears throat> and then, of course, one of the, the things we use commonly is uh, hashes, right? Just like anywhere else, hashes are, are, are a great way to officially describe or fingerprint a particular file, assuming it hasn't worked. And then we have the, either the ability, right? So we either have payload bin or URL, and this is a, is a one or the other deal. What this means is because we're packing this data in JSON, these can end up being huge files, right? If I'm looking at an attack on something like a PXD, on like a pre-execution environment, right? The attack surface may be a VM. Right, so you obviously don't want to stuff a VM to a JSON message that you're passing around. And so this says, hey, let me reference this through an S3 bucket or through a, a URL which is available to us without having to ship all that information between our sensors. And here's what, it'll, here's what an artifact actually ends up looking like in JSON. For anybody who works in text, this is actually a binary. Right? Even though it looks like string, this is base 64 encoded data. I don't know that that one actually is. But you can imagine how large that would be for a multi megabyte file. And that's one of the huge problems. That's one of the problems with respect to using JSON is that it's not very good for passing binary. JSON's not a good way to pass binary data. In the case of extensions, so one of the objects we mentioned was the file object, right? And so the file objects are, are, pretty, are pretty obvious in terms of what they are. But extensions allow us to sort of get down to a more granular level of detail. Like they allow us to, to, to provide the metadata particular to a to whatever our instantiation is of that file. In this case, you can imagine that um, something on, um, uh, for example, an archive file, right? We can go get in there and describe it, whether or not it's going to be a gzip file, what are going to be the names of the files that are compiled inside it, whatever it's manifest. Whereas for, for example, raster image file, it can be a completely different step, right? We might want to know what the histogram is. The layout we want to know what the XY or the DPI is of the image. And so <clears throat> this provides sort of our generalized level and the ability to add specificity. And we can add specificity too, right? I mean, so we can have, for example, an image that is stored on NTFS that happens to be a raster file. So we can bind, combine multiple extensions into a, uh, to a cyber observable, the old cybox, to, to add that level of detail. And here's what they end up looking like, for example, when you're looking for a PE, right? So this means not only am I looking at a file, but I'm looking at one that's executable file. And here's the metadata that I care about in terms of um, what type is this? Is EXE? Is it a CR? And just like SDOs, we can customize them, right? We can have our own observables, right? So, in addition to IPv4, IPv6 addresses, we may, for example, want to have um, a Bluetooth map, right? We want to be able to have uh, the identifier for a Bluetooth motor, for example, in our space, because our computers happen to communicate pretty often over VL with Bluetooth, low energy, or other areas like that. So, I've got the ability to add that, or I've got the ability to enrich. You know the current cybox set with the data we're looking for, and then of course the extensions. And you know this is what we talked about, right? The ability to add that level of detail. Next, uh, six patterning language. If you've used Yar rules, if you've used Bro, I, I hate they call it Bro script, script, not the Bro code. But <laughs> you know, you know they are actually they have a marketing firm they're working with now, but they are changing the name of Bro. They are? Yes. Not the bro code. They're not have bro code script. No, they're getting away from yeah. the whole concept of bro being bro. No, bro stuff. 
Yes. Here's that chart here. We'll go through a couple more examples. But in this case, um, sticks pattern language is actually used to describe and it, you know, how we detect the actual indicator, right? So it can have, um, for example, in the case of an observation operator, this is uh, can be typical. In this case, it's followed by, right? So in other words, if we see, you know, this, I, you know, we see either of these two IP addresses, right? Then followed by a, a message coming in with a certain domain name within um, within ten minutes of each other, all right? So that that allows us to set up sort of the temporal restrictions as well as the matching on the observables. And this language is parsed the same by anybody who's got a sticks pattern language parser. Um, I don't, I've actually written one. There, um, it provides it's useful for a number of, for a number of cases. The obvious case is that we can match on events, right? We, the ability to say, okay, that's great that you know analyst Susie over here at you know Bank of America has found this piece or whatever else, but what does that mean for me? It, you know, thanks, look, good job, Susie. But now what? And so the answer is is that pattern language provides, you know, in theory, it provides a way no matter what my particular vendor set is of data, right? Whatever my implementation, whether it be Cisco, whether it be Blue Code, whether it be what have you. Is that I can apply this this pattern here within my infrastructure um, instead of having to rely on some sort of standard tied to a vendor or even a particular implementation. Right. Another nice thing about it, and so we are actually in the business of writing a taxi server. So one of the important things about being able to to parse a, and validate a six pattern language is because if somebody sends you an indicator, you want to know if it will ever execute. Right. Um, there's a weird feature in the way the language spec is written right now that I can say. If event A occurs within 300 seconds, within 200 seconds, within five seconds, completely meaningless construct, right? So, what's important is if this is an event that can never possibly occur because, or that this language can't be interpreted correctly, I don't want to stuff this indicator in my database because chances are an indicator in a database is going to translate to CPU cycles and slowing down your infrastructure. If you write a bad pattern, you're in a world of hurt on your IDS. And I, for anybody who's written custom patterns. You know, it is typically involves, right? It, it involves a lot of fun, pain, and learning around a finite state machine that you don't necessarily want, right? Discrete finite automata. So the trick is not even custom ones. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not, it's, yeah, and so you can't afford your information, up, your information um, infrastructure, your pipeline to go down the tubes, you know, because you're getting chewed up like that. So it's important to say, hey, I'm going to load this indicator in my database. Will it ever, can it ever possibly match that, right? So this is a, it makes for a funnier research. We've already talked about this while we want something that's not tied to a particular implementation. But finally, this is fun from if we can parse that language, let me go back. Right? <clears throat> if I can parse this language here for in this case, we're looking at IPv4 addresses and a domain name. If I have an indic if I have two indicators coming across my window and they're Windows PE files, then the question is those, that pattern will never match on it, so I should never even bother to execute. And so by being able to to parse this into an abstract syntax syntax tree, we can say Here's an indicator here. It's got nothing to do with me and what I'm seeing on my um, net flow indicators right now, for example. Here's what it looks like. Um, and they provide a lot of you know, interesting tricks in terms of we're all everybody's used to matching on a hash file, right? I mean, the hash file is just bread and butter for ever since the days of triple R, right? But <clears throat> being able to say, oh, the, by the way, this came in and it was digitally signed by this certificate. That becomes a little bit more interesting, particular, for example, if somebody compromises a certificate gain trust for a thought software on your, on your box, for example, you know, Stuxnet like or whatever else, and, and maybe I want indicators based on that compromised search. Next, we'll talk about Taxi 2. So, Stix is the data, right? It goes back and forth. Well, Taxi is the exchange in this case, and what Taxi does is it provides, um, it provides methods to pass. Um, Cyber threat intelligence, including sticks too, right? Um, between uh, clients, it's a uh, between clients and servers, right? It's a uh, request response based. So it's HTTPS JSON. So in theory, Taxi is not coupled to sticks. In practice, Taxi is all about spitting out sticks two data, right? Just for the record, they both speak JSON, right? As their sort of native form of data serialization. Taxi is Kind of a RESTful server if you're used to the representational state transfer as a way of describing, you know, the state of a server versus something like an SOA, a service-oriented architecture. 
So in this case, it's eh, it's kind of like that. But the basics of it are the endpoints, right? And this is what I want to do. Do I want to publish an observation, right, in stick format to your server, right? In other words, I want to say, hey, this is what I saw. Or do I want to query it and say, hey, tell me what observations you've seen in the last 30 days? That could be a lot. It, you know, could it be, um, you know, or tell me about your different endpoints or do I even have access to them? And it does this in a couple different formats. API routes, you know, consider these URLs, right? This is, all right, this is the, the basis for it might serve different groups, for example. Um, for example, Semantic might have their own API route, right? And they may have different ones based on what they're providing, whether or not they're providing indicators on um, exploding malware inside of test chambers, right? Sometimes we execute malware and VMs to get information on threats, right? So they may have an API route based on that, right? And then underneath that, they might have um, collections, right? The collections could be for, you know, well, I've got one for ransomware or whatever else. They each have their sort of different metadata about them. And the final piece is objects, right? And the objects are any form of cyber threat intel, technically. Truthfully, what it is is sticks to data, right? Typically, it's going to be a combination of sticks data objects, relationship objects, and um, cyber observables, right, that describe what it is that the, the analysts are seeing. There's two types uh, in the taxi world right now. This one doesn't, channel server as it implies doesn't exist yet. The, in this case, collection server is basically a web server database, right, with an automated API. And what this is is the ability to upload, query, and search. But it's very much based on, um, you can think of as sort of the database querying case as I am looking for this. The next version that's going to come out, and this is where we'll make our money on our implementation, is the channel server. And that is, <clears throat> channel servers, unlike, unlike a collection server, don't even have to store the information locally. For example, if I'm talking about something like Symantec's um, uh, detonation chamber on malware, I once once they have a detonation, right? They say, "Oh, all right, this malware went off, and here's what it did." Once those indicators go up, they can just send it to everybody who's listening, right? They don't want to have to record it because it happens all the time. It's a huge set of data. It's probably not worth keeping, except for people who want to listen to it on a um, on an ephemeral basis. And so that's the basis for what the what the channel server is next. The collection server is, here's my database, here's queries, I serve, data, I serve queries um, that I receive over my web server, query the database, and send information back. That's the, the gist of it. <clears throat> actually, the ability to discover taxi servers actually built into DNS through SRV, the server records and DNS. So if I know where an, an organization's domain name is served from, I actually, can actually go there, find an SRV record, and go back to the API route from that level. So it actually starts at the HTTP level. But <clears throat> taxi server tells me everything about it, right? <clears throat> taxi underneath the, the, the taxi deal, the discovery deal, tell me, okay, these are my API routes. I can just start walking each API route and say, tell me about yourself. I can know things, for example, like um, what are the collections available in that API route. I can know what the maximum uh, size of the payload that API route will, that API route will accept. So if I try to push a five gig file that describes malware I found in my pre-execution environment, if I try to push that um, PXE um, artifact, it'll throw up and say, no, you can't send me a, you can't post a six gig file to me over um, HTTPS. <clears throat> on the status side, you've actually got the ability to push payloads to taxi and not have them upload immediately, right? We can queue them for asynchronous upload. So I go back and say, hey, what happened to that message I sent you six hours ago about um, the, the spear fishing campaign we just hit. Did it upload, yes or no? The status, obviously, like everything else, comes back to the UID and says, yep, these completed successfully, these fail. And then this is an example of what you see right on the way back. A bundle is just a way to put a bunch of objects. Oh, sorry, let's see if I missed any of these. Um, manifest obviously is going to tell me metadata about a deal, when it was added to the server, right? Um, uh, data added is important because it gives us a way to sort stuff. Because nine times out of ten, I don't care about these indicators that you saw three years ago. Really, I want to, it's my way to top off on a server, right? It's where I said, it's a way for me to pull and fill my database in your server by pulling it every hour and say, give me all measurements for the last hour, for example. And one thing that's interesting here is that when I'm going to, when I post here um, to objects, that's how I upload objects in the server, and then it gives me an ID for them back. But whereas, um, and I can fetch the list. But here it's interesting, anytime I get something by object ID, a lot of people find it's unusual that if I retrieve an object from a uh, taxi server uh, by an object ID, which is supposed to uniquely identify an SDO, that it can return more than one object. 
But in this case, what it actually has the ability to do, if your tax server supports it, it's going to return versions, right? So it's the same object ID. But remember, an object is not uniquely identified by its object ID. It's actually a combination of that plus the versions, right, which is the created ref. The, the ID, the created ref, and the modified ref give you the actual set of versions for it. So I can see, here's the last four versions, and okay, here's where it got revoked in version five, or it's still active. Here's the indicators you get back. In this case, you get back a set of indicators. This is coming back as a bundle. Um, bundles, in, objects you get back in a bundle don't have to be related, right? I'm, it could be simply because of size restrictions, but this may refer to example, this could have a created by rep to, you know, my favorite analyst, Susie over Bank of America. Well, the identity object describing her might not come until I fetch the next bundle, right? This is just a way for us to group batch together objects to send them over the wire. This is the sort of, sort of metadata you're going to see about things like um, an object or a collection. For example, in this case, we can know whether or not something is using version 2, 2.1 of the spec, whatever else. And then um, you'll say, oh, I've got multiple versions of this, right? In this case, the versions of it are the modified data. <clears throat> and the next step um, in terms of, you don't see a lot of sticks and taxi 2 products out there yet. Um, uh, but we will shortly because it's taxi 2 preferred suite. And this is actually what I'm heading to in June, is to go up to the interop you know, for this to put our server um, on the test run for it. It's a combination of two interoperability test suites. Everybody's responses have to be the same. If you say, hey, I passed these, you certify a letter that, yep, indeed it does. So you go on this, the taxi and Oasis uh, preferred tube list. And then you're one of the folks who play in this space. And then when I, when I participate in a plug fest on interoperability committees, this is what we see, right? We just say, hey, my client can talk to your server and gather information. And right now, it's really rudimentary, right? It's very, you know, straightforward stuff. We're not doing asynchronous uploads. We're not doing anything very complicated. But just to get to the point where we have interoperability across the group. And so, like I mentioned before, I don't really care about CTI, right? I'm not an analyst. I'm not a defender. It's not my space. I'm interested in distributed stuff. So part of what we're working on right now is actually our own suite of um, and taxi two tools. Originally, we thought, hey, we're just going to write a taxi server. But the problem is, you can't really write a taxi server without implementing every other part of the suite. Um, so we had to write Stones, which is a six, uh, actually does validation of all the different data types. Has to have all the different um, uh, open vocabularies. Has to be able to do stuff like granular and object data markings, right, across the whole set. It's got to be able to interpret six pattern language, right? So you have to. Have that, you know, if you've gone through compilers before, you've got to have, you know, pull out flex or, you know, flex and yak, flex and vice and ant or whatever your tools of choice are. You have to write your grammar parser, generate the, generate the ST. So that's part of what we have in place now. And then we're, uh, shuttle bus is what we'll put up for the actual certification run. So wait, is, are these two not acronyms? No. So stones? I'm amazed. Stones? <laughs> so if you look at sticks, it's all capital. Right. Stones is all lowercase, but like it, it's misspelled. Right. Sticks yeah. and stones. So and then shuttle bus. But, but stones isn't an acronym for anything. No. So this, a, so this is part. So this is part of the product name, right? So this is excellent. Stones is uh, sticks. Well done. Sticks library, and shuttle bus is because it's highly concurrent. It's designed for concurrency. So shuttle bus is a concurrent form of taxi, right? Like a taxi, but you put more people in. Right. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> but it's not an acronym. That's not an acronym. the first thing in this whole presentation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's true. All right. And that concludes my very enthralling presentation on cyber threat intelligence. Cool. Questions? Lindsay. Yes. Yeah. Question. Yeah. 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 I don't know enough to know that I don't know. So, <laughs> <laughs> never mind all that. Yeah, no, I've got, this is one of those talks that I'm going to have to go do research to understand the talk. Oh, yeah. Uh, Good news, it's no, recorded on YouTube, so you can watch it anytime you want. I, I didn't know how any of this stuff worked, so. I, I, yeah, I barely do either. I enjoyed the dive, <laughs> so. I don't know what it does, but I love it. Yeah. Well, you don't have to understand it to make it work. Yeah, it's, it's true. And yeah. then, <laughs> just got past the test. beautiful thing about an API. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> So um, it, it is kind of funny though, because you're you say don't reference any uh, language, and you use like Yara as an example, yeah. which goes back to your uh, XKCD, which is this is the standard that's replacing yeah, yeah, yeah. these standards. Don't reference these standards. Reference okay. this standard. So 
what it's trying to do is it's vendor lock in. It's got to be an answer, right? You know, or, or is supposed to be. But the problem is, is there's all the stuff that gets around. It. What it eventually will go to, and there's there's other standards in place too that make it really interesting, right? Because one of the big initiatives, I would say, that's running parallel on the same folks that participated in, in the standard. Additionally, during the CTI title committee, I'm also on the Open C2, which is Open Command and Control. And Open Command and Control is interesting because it's right. How it handles orchestration, right? How, how do I automate my defense, right? And so, okay, something's happening. Now what? You say, oh, I go through the playbook. I do this. I do that. I do that. So Open C2 is designed to how do I automate? Right? Understanding there's risk here, right? And Open C and the Open C2 gets a lot more risky. It's like how do I do your network defense response actions, right, to handle the events that occur, right? It might be, all right, I'm getting nailed over here. If this happens and it causes the machine to go down through something like a slow loss, I'm going to DNS black hole this client, right? That could be an idea of how I'm going to automate deals, right? But in this case, that involves looking at indicators coming off my HTTP server logs, right? Monitoring Apache or Nginx or whatever people use, IIS, whatever folks use these days. Correlating those with, you know, who, Who's the source that's hitting this? It might not be the backend server. It might be a, a proxy, right? It might be your F5 load balancer. So right now we're already on two different vendors, right? You, know, you got your F5 big IP local local traffic manager out here. You know, got an application server by IBM or Microsoft. And by the way, I'm going to go to my DNS infrastructure, which might be hosted, right, and say, oh, we're going to go ahead and black hole this IP address. Means when they ask me for what's the IP address for anything within my DNS range, I'm going to give them 127.0.0.1. Knock yourself out. All right, you give local, you know, just point it back to local host, and all right, so at least we can, you know, help knock that off. Truthfully, once they already hit your server, they've already got your IP address and cache, but don't worry about that. With DNS black hole, you know, these techniques are, are example things that we might want to orchestrate across vendors. So in the open C2 case, it becomes very clear why we want vendor neutral um, uh, ways to pass the data, right? But what we really want to do is be able to link this up, right? So on, on, on the outset, I've got to describe what I see, right? And there's a lot of stuff to describe hashes, right? There's not enough, and there's plenty of stuff that describes things like attack sets, right? I mean, we all go read, you know, the latest blog to figure out what cutesy bear or whoever else is doing next. But describing those in a language that we can agree on and connecting them to indicators and connecting analysts uh, gives you sort of that next level deal and eventually being able to take the indicators and then plug them in OpenC2 to say, okay, my cyber threat intelligence, I can even proactively respond, right? I can react. And people used to do that all the time, right? I, mean, I don't know how many people used to take uh, the SANS Storm Center's top 50 offending IP addresses and just go ahead and put them on there. You know, at least give them a rate limiter or, or on your traffic chamber, much less just go ahead and block them, right? I mean, people do that. You know, I mean, and same thing for, we do it all the time already in the email space, resting TV, where we say, all right, certain people have a, a reputation, right? Especially with some of us. You know, this SMTP server doesn't have the correct reputation, we're not allowing them to pass through. You know, and those sorts of, you know, those sorts of things are already there. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's a couple dollars in there, right? And that's why I got in this thing, too, is not because I really care about CTI. My background's IoT, right? It's Internet of Things and, you know, handling a lot of telemetry, a lot of data concurrently. Well, at the point we start passing CTI data, and it's heavy like this, you have to be pretty wide to be able to handle, you know, to be able to handle a lot of current data because there are there are indicator databases on the government side in the billions, right? And so, as you get that finer level of detail, not just capturing a, you know, NetFlow data, but maybe I'm capturing, you know, HTTP. Maybe I'm looking at HTTP, right? Maybe I look at HTTP headers. Maybe I'm catching all the way to PCAP, right? When you get this level of detail, because of, you get more CPUs, this gets cheaper, whatever else, the indicators just start to flood. So there's got to be a system that can do it well and do it concurrently. So I think part of the future of that, you know, going back is the actual, this over here on the, is on the um, side of, is not just, I'm just playing around with the collection server right now because the channel servers I think are where it's at, right? I mean, if I'm producing a ton of data, I don't necessarily want to have a stockpile of archive this stuff. I mean, nobody's, Using the Wayback Machine for cyber threat intelligence. Nobody said, "Oh, tell me about that system that got exploited 10 years ago." Right? There, there's some level at which this cuts off, but the ability to pass around quickly, more like on a transactional versus an analytical speed, what I see or the threats I'm facing here, I think channel server, I think is, is a portion of where that's at, right? And there's there's there gets to be points where 
the technologies we use to our day to day stuff, whether it be transna transactional relational database management system, whether it be, you know, to request response aren't fast enough. They're not, um, you know, if you go look at this, folks who handle incredibly heavy loads, folks like um, YouTube back in the day were one of the first people to use the Lighty database uh, web server because it gave them an extra edge. You know, Facebook came up with the MySQL database like Cassandra or whatever else to help, you know, because, you know, at some point MySQL doesn't cut it for some loads. And so, you know, I think purpose built systems around this area are sort of kind of where it's going to go. Uh, discussion coming up um, on uh, Open LDAP, right? BDB, the Berkeley database, is a well known fast KV, K, key value store, right? Say, okay, I need the ability to go execute something in memory, you know, to get more performance on my open LDAP server. That type of stuff, you know, is, is how you win the fight because it, it becomes inches, not miles, and those sort of struggles. Uh, I haven't seen chat anything, so. Let's see. No. Thank you you whittled them down to two online, by the way. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> Good job, Drew. No attrition, no morale. <laughs> thank you, Drew. Yeah, thank uh, you very much. Um, Travel tickets. Why don't we give away two books? Give away two books. <laughs> uh, sounds like a brilliant right. plan. If you bought a ticket, you win. Right. <laughs> Congratulations. Go pick uh, a book. Jokes on everyone else. See, he told you about a ticket. <laughs> Oh, if you didn't buy a ticket, you win a pizza. We're starting on the sticks portion of the five seventy eight. Oh, cool. Yeah, sure. It'll be on six one, I'm sure. It won't be on six two.